Hi, I'm Dr. Randy Martin with the Marcus Heart Valve Center at Piedmont Heart in Atlanta, and I'm really pleased to be joined by a good friend and a very well-known cardiologist, uh, Dr. Luigi Bandano. Luigi is professor of CV imaging, cardiovascular imaging, at I believe the oldest medical school in the in the world, just about at the University of Padua in Italy. You are correct, Randy. It has been founded in uh, two. Uh, one, uh, 1,202 and is the oldest medical school in the Western uh, world. Yeah, I mean, it's a phenomenal place. I've un unfortunately never been there, but I know a lot of people that are there and it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal, not only historically, but what you all do in, in, in advancing cardiovascular care. So Luigi, um, you've really been at the forefront of our understanding and imaging of the tricuspid valve. Where do we stand with uh, imaging the tricuspid valve because it's incredibly important now in valvular heart disease? Uh, during the last uh, five years, uh, we have learned that uh, we have a powerful uh, uh, tool in our hands, that is the three-dimensional echocardiography, that uh, quite interestingly, it is uh, much better uh, from transthoracic than transesophageal approach that you can imagine the tricuspid valve, understand the morphology, and so uh, give the pathophysiological explanation of uh, the regurgitation. And now we have also tools to make a quantitation of uh, the tricuspid annulus that may serve for uh, selecting patients uh, uh, for procedures. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about that because that's a, you know, is an on, I mean, just with transthoracic two-dimensional echo, I don't think people have a good understanding of not only the names of the three leaflets, but how you measure the annulus. So how does, and, and annular measurement's very important with surgical considerations for tricuspid annuloplasty. How does 3D help us in knowing the size and the shape of the tricuspid annulus? Uh, this is uh, mainly because of using conventional two-dimensional echocardiography and using uh, the four-chamber view, you make uh, this uh, diameter measurement. But since the crescentic shape uh, of, the of the right ventricle and uh, the uh, ovoidal shape of the tricuspid annulus, you never know where you are in the circumference of the right. tricuspid annulus. So with 3D echocardiography, we can look at the tricuspid annulus on face, mm -hmm. realizing the uh, or, uh, anatomical orientation, and uh, so making the true diameters, the anteroposterior and the most important septum lateral diameters, that is the one that enlarges most uh, in a patient with functional tricuspid regurgitation. So you can, you can not only see what the true diameter is, but figure out what's the most important. Exactly. Have we been measuring that inaccurately with, with uh, our standard echo approach? Uh, or almost always. And uh, this is why uh, cardiac surgeons uh, usually don't believe so much right. in our conventional measurements. And when the, they are in doubt, they prefer open the right atrium, put the four fingers in uh, the annulus, and see if they pass, they will uh, go for annuloplasty. If they don't pass, they will leave uh, the annulus as it is. But now they have a reliable tool to uh, know well in advance that opening the chest of the patients, if that, if that particular patient will need a uh, tricuspid annulopathy or not. I mean, I, I think it's a tremendous advance because, you know, I used to think that with, without 3D TE, but, but transesophageal echo, that the transgastric view, the short axis view of the tricuspid leaflets was much more useful, but I can understand how 3D TE is really even much, even more useful. Yes, definitely. It's really useful, less uh, painful for uh, the patients, and allows you to save the money of the transesophageal procedure. And if you are in doubt, you can uh, always uh, perform a transesophageal study when the patient is uh, under anesthesia on the operating room. This will save money, time, and uh, uh, pain. So, so you're, you're saying with transthoracic 3D, you now feel confident enough that, that we don't need a transesophageal 3D outside of the procedure room? Um, as you know, echocardiography depends very much on uh, the quality of the images. Correct. Not all the patients uh, are uh, um, equally good uh, acoustic window, but if you have at least a decent acoustic window, this is definitely right. reliable and feasible. 
Another question. Um, a lot of now increasing in emphasis in tethering of the tricuspid leaflet. So it's not just annular dilatation, it's tethering of the leaflets, whether there should be even augmentation of the leaflets. Yeah. Are we at the stage with echo, whether it's transthoracic or transesophageal, especially 3D, where we can begin to, to tell that mechanism, tell the length of the leaflets, and see if the leaflet tethering is a big, big issue? Yeah, um, uh, leaflet tethering for sure is uh, the most powerful predictor of residual uh, tricuspid regurgitation after what was supposed to be a successful procedure. And now we have a, a way to quantitate it independent on the shape of the tethering, that is measuring the tenting volume. There are several papers, uh, mainly coming from uh, uh, Korea, but also from the United States and Europe, showing that this tenting volume is the most powerful predictor of the need of uh, um, uh, leaflet augmentations right. to have a really successful procedure and uh, to avoid uh, uh, relapse of regurgitation after surgery. So is that something you're measuring routinely in, in patients when you're evaluating them? Uh, not routinely, but in every patient that that we are going to consider for tricuspid annuloplasty. And you do the you do the tenting volume from a 3D data set or okay. Yes, from the transthoracic 3D data. That's set. cool. That's cool. Let me ask Luigi, you know, for years I, I don't think we had a good handle echocardiographically on how to evaluate right ventricular function. We're pretty good on LV function, but right ventricular function, especially now as it's uh, with tricuspid valve abnormalities or coexistent valve abnormalities. What's, what's the state of the art in echocardiographic measurements of, of right ventricular function? Is it 2D, M mode, TAPSI, strain? Um, what, where are we? I think that we still can rely on 2D images, but not just measuring TAPSI or fractional area change, but using the uh, 2D images to have uh, the assessment of uh, right ventricular myocardia through the formation imaging. The measurement of the strain and the strain rate have, uh, uh, have been proven to be highly predictive uh, of uh, outcome in uh, patients uh, with uh, diseases affecting the right ventricle or affecting the left ventricle but with the consequences on the right. On the other end, we can also use 3D echocardiography to measure and not calculate anymore the volumes of the right ventricle and to uh, calculate the ejection fraction. What's, what's the accuracy of, of 3D evaluation of right ventricular function and, um, and ejection fraction versus MR, which is many people would say is the gold standard? Yeah. Um, Meta-analysis and all, almost all the studies have demonstrated that, that uh, 3D echo underestimates uh, the, the volumes that are measured uh, with the CMR. But um, uh, about the ejection fraction, they are really close. So the underestimation seem to affect uh, equally the end diastolic and end systolic volume, so the resulting ejection fraction is closer right. to the CMR. So we can uh, confidently use this index uh, to assess uh, the uh, right ventricle pump function. And are, are, is it accurate enough that we can do follow-up studies on people after intervention and see what happens to right ventricular function over time? Yes, this is it's definitely it's reproducible and also um, uh, there are data showing that the particular in patients undergoing a cardiac surgery, TAPS is not reliable anymore after a cardiac surgery in assessing re uh, right ventricular function, while ejection fraction has been shown to be uh, good to follow the evolution of a right ventricular function in those patients. So you've been, a, um, final question, you've been a, a leader in, in one of the uh, very valuable, our European colleagues, you've been a leader in, in advancing imaging and advancing echo utilization. Five, ten years from now, okay, I guess you put on your futuristic, uh, your future view, where, where is, what's going to be the role of echo in valvular heart disease? And, and is the technology going to be handheld? Is it going to be remote uh, imaging? What, you know, what's the role and what's the technology going to look like? Just off the top of your head. Yeah, uh, I think that the role uh, uh, will be expanding. It, it is the cheapest and the safest technologies that we have to assess the patients. 
uh, providing that those patients can be explored by ultrasound, otherwise we can rely on a CMR. I think that the new miniaturization and improvement in image quality will even expand the role of echo. And then we have a different tool for different purposes. Handheld uh, echo, pocket size echo, just to say, OK, this patient has a vulvar disease or is not a vulvar disease. And then you send it to have a complete uh, uh, studies with high-end echo machine to have a comprehensive assessment and to provide the data that can be helpful in planning cardiac surgery and to predict the outcome afterwards. Good. Good luck to the future. I tend to agree with you. But, uh, but as I said, you, you and your colleagues in Europe have been certainly leaders in advancing and, and helping us on, on this side of the ocean to uh, figure things out well. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we've learned a lot and I hope that you'll come back and view some more. Thank you, Randy. It's been a great honor and a pleasure to be here tonight with you.